Good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Austrian Cultural Forum New York, I would like to warmly welcome you to tonight's dance performance and discussion on inclusive music making, accessibility, and their innovative applications in the arts. Thank you all for joining us tonight. It is wonderful to have you. And we are particularly honored to welcome Ms. Akiko Ito, Chief of the United Nations Secretariat for the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Let me also take this opportunity to thank our partners from the Austrian Essel Foundation's Zero Project, as well as our colleagues from the Permanent Mission of Austria to the United Nations in New York, to whom we owe this wonderful event tonight. Before we dive into the program, just very quickly, the Austrian Cultural Forum showcases contemporary Austrian art. We offer concerts, readings, film screenings, exhibitions, and theater, always free of charge. So if you're interested, um, I invite you to check our program and our events, events on our website. Please come again. And now, without further ado, let me wish you all an enjoyable evening and give the floor to Hans Almos Lechner, Deputy, represent, Deputy Representative of Austria to the United Nations in New York. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Helena. It is my sincere pleasure to also welcome you today to this very important side event, inclus inclusive music making accessibility and their innovative applications in the arts. Organized together with our partners, the Essel Foundation, uh, with its Zero Project and the Austrian Cultural Forum. Uh, we are particularly honored to continue our partnership with such an active Austrian NGO that holds uh, the participation of persons with disabilities in the arts so dear to its heart. Austria is renowned worldwide for its diverse cultural and art scene, from classical music and theater to modern dance and acting. Ensuring accessibility and inclusivity in the arts is therefore an essential aspect of ensuring that persons with disabilities can effectively enjoy their human rights and participate fully in Austrian society. When art and music are accessible and innovative, they can be powerful tools for the self-advocacy, enabling persons with disabilities to live a meaningful, independent, and culturally rich life. The provisions enshrined in Article 30 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities call on states' parties to recognize the right of persons with dis disabilities to take part on an equal basis with others in cultural life. This includes appropriate measures that enable persons with disabilities to have the opportunity to develop and utilize their creative, artistic, and intellectual potential, not only for their own benefit, but also for the enrichment of society as a whole. Austria continues to advocate for accessibility and participation of persons with disabilities in all aspects of life. We are proud to being a part of this side event that gives persons with disabilities the, the space and their music of being heard. Expression through music is essential for so many of us. I am therefore eager to learn more on how music and musical instruments are being made more accessible and inclusive by our distinguished speakers this evening. We will discuss uh, how to bring the convention closer to people's lives and communities around the world. But let me stop here and hand over to Mr. Fembeck from Zero Project I thank you very much for your attention, and I wish you a wonderful evening. I also thank the UN, of course, for being here. Thank you. Yeah, a very warm welcome also from my side. Let me uh, start by thanking the Austrian Cultural Forum for making uh, this event happen. It's, uh, it's n uh, something experimental that we're doing together here since it's not only this event that we are physically part of today, but it will also be shown tomorrow uh, as a side event uh, to the Conference of State Parties. So thank you for making uh, this happen. Uh, we really appreciate this. And let me also thank you, uh, thank the permanent mission of Austria uh, to the United Nations here in New York for the constant and, uh, uh, and, and, and always excellent uh, cooperation uh, for so many years now. The event today, is with, which we're really looking forward to, is, uh, is on accessible and inclusive music. And uh, one more reason to thank the Austrian Cultural Institute to tackle this, uh, this uh, interesting topic, which still uh, has a lot of challenges ahead. So we're really thankful that we can do this 
um, together. But my main job here is to introduce the moderator uh, of tonight, uh, Lachi, and uh, I've got some prepared presentation. It's such an impressive uh, CV that um, actually I don't want to make any mistakes. I'm reading this uh, from, a, from a paper. So Lachi is a, a blind, multi-award-winning artist, a Grammy board member and founder and president of REMPD.org. She has dedicated her platform, career, and craft to amplifying disability culture, promoting inclusion, and advocating for accessibility in the music industry. Named a dedicated foot soldier for disability pride by Forbes, Lachi has held talks with the White House, the UN, and the Kennedy Center, and has been featured in Essence, Billboard, and the New York Times for celebrating intersectionality through art and for her upbeat and unapologetic un a word almost incomprehensible for an Austrian, an um, unapologetic -ap brand of disability pride. So welcome, Lachi. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I have my notes as well. My name is Vlachi, she, her, and I'm a black woman with cornrows. I am wearing a red dress and I have a red cane. I am a recording artist who's traveled the world for my art and I am the founder and president of ramp.org. And thank you again, Michael, for that amazing introduction. Um, I do advocate a lot for disability culture, so I'm very excited to be here today. Um, but I just want to, if you couldn't tell, I proudly identify as a blind woman, um, legally blind, so you can see how large my notes are. Um, so I want to welcome you to the Inclusive Music Making Accessibility and Innovative um, Applications in the Arts. And of course, I want to thank the Austrian Cultural Forum of New York for having this and give a huge shout out to the Zero Project for looking for creative ways for good best practices so that there are zero barriers for people with disabilities. Disabled people include all diversities, all walks of life, and represent an identity culture that should be celebrated. Disability culture includes our contributions, our art, our words, our perspective, our movements, and our music. Disability culture is rooted in problem solving, and it is a vibrant counter response to the marginalization that many people with disabilities face. When it comes to the arts, we don't need pity. We need innovative solutions so we can creatively express our vast, beautiful, and vibrant disability experiences. Tonight's event is a showcase of inclusive arts and music technologies that underlines the power of innovation in advocating and advancing disability rights and disability culture. So tonight, we're going to have an amazing dance performance. And following that dance performance, we're going to have a roundtable discussion on different facets in the arts that are making ways to be more accessible. So first up, a dance performance by the amazing and wonderful danceability. So just a real quick intro and uh, sort of a quick bio on danceability. Danceability is a contemporary dance practice allowing people with and without disabilities to dance and move together. The work of danceability helps decrease prejudice in the field of dance and by extension in society. Tonight's dance is a five minute piece from Danceability directed by Connie Vanderakis. The dance will continue in silence after the music ends, so hold your applause. The dancers tonight all have very acclaimed and accomplished 
professional careers in the arts. Performers will be dressed in everyday clothing wear with a color palette of white, tan, blue, and green tones. Ladies and gentle persons, I want to welcome Jeron Ger Herman, Epchez Josie Yes, Madeline Malinger, and Connie Vanderakis of Danceability.
discussion, and I want to briefly uh, mention all of the speakers that you'll be hearing from today during this discussion. Obviously, you know myself. We are joined by Connie Vanderakis, Education Director of Danceability International um, and Arts and Cultural Director of Disability Pride Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania. We're also joined by Hans Joachim, um, Almos Lechner, Deputy, um, sorry, De Deputy Permanent Representative. Is Hans Joachim on the stage? No, on, on, no. The, on the stage is, uh, is Connie, uh, is myself, Michael. Okay, yeah. good, yeah. all right, yeah. just making sure I was, <laughs> my confusion was correct, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Fembeck, Director of Zero Project, um, and Mira, uh, I'm sorry, and Yara Kadim, Associate Director at Real Abilities Film Festival. So these are our panelists here, and we will also be joined from folks speaking virtually as we watch some videos that we're gonna be watching. But today during this discussion, we're gonna talk about different types of art and how we are working to make them more inclusive and accessible, and what we can do. Ah, do I need a microphone? Yeah, you can Hello, oh yes, I love the sound of my voice through a microphone. <laughs> Okay, so we'll be talking about different forms of art, how we are working to make them more inclusive, and how we are working to make them more accessible. I think that it would be great to start with accessibility in dance, since we've watched this really amazing dance performance by Danceability, and we happen to have the producer, director here on the stage. So Connie, um, I wanna start with you, and we can open it up to broader discussion, but it was such a lovely piece. Can you talk about what went into it? Why? It is inclusive, it's message, and why you chose that song. Huh. Uh, definitely, thank you um, for that question. Um, danceability is to, brings people with and without disabilities together to practice improvisation, um, to build community, um, to break down barriers, uh, prejudice in dance, that anyone can dance and practice in dance, um, whether it's professional, or for your own personal practice. Um, the piece you saw today, uh, was we titled it the same as the song, The Sound of Silence. I thought it was very appropriate for a music um, panel uh, because silence is important too, uh, which is why we ended in dancing in silence. But that song uh, was performed by Simon and Garfunkel and was released in 1964. The title, or the first line, um, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend, um, actually came from a story of Art Garfunkel and his college roommate, Sandy Greenberg. And Sandy lost his vision when they were in college and he actually left college and it was Art Garfunkel that went back and said, Sandy, you have to come back to school. And was, and you know, this is before the ADA um, had anything to do with, with disability. And he helped him through college and he helped him gain independence as a, a person without vision. Um, and Sandy Greenberg has also written a book Hello, darkness, my old friend. So I thought it was terribly important um, for us to dance to that as a piece. And in dance, we use music, uh, live music, recorded music, um, and um, independent music makers um, to aid us in getting um, our thoughts across in the dance. So thank you. That's awesome. Um, just one other question about bringing folks with disabilities and without disabilities together to create. Um, this is a question for anyone who wants to answer, but um, in terms of creating art, uh, is there need for more creation between disabled folks and non-disabled folks? Or should we be uplifting uh, disabled creator, creative artists um, alone so that we can showcase their art? Like which space 
uh, is better focused or do we focus on both? I, I would just like to take a quick shot at that. I would say both of those things need to happen together. Uh, we need to support um, economically um, disabled artists that have been disenfranchised for many years. And also there is mutual learning that occurs in the collaboration between people with and without disabilities. And the people without disabilities learn so much from the disabled community. So there's a lot of mutual learning that happens. Anyone else? I can give it a go. This is Yara speaking. Um, I, I, I think those two things are inseparable. I think there is, uh, there, there is no way to proceed in a positive way that is consistent, that will continue to create um, um, innovative, creative art without working on it together and supporting each other. Saying that, I do feel like everyone should get their time to shine. And sometimes there are some um, aspects or creators that maybe need to, you know, step aside and understand when it's time to, to let uh, other creators shine for, for the sake of even just having new perspectives, new content, um, um, new uh, ways of creating. Um, and I think uh, that is something that once everyone can agree on and understand together, um, we'll probably have the best outcome. Um, one uh, and additional remark from my side from the research that we are doing on the, with the Zero Project. I think it's not only about uh, creating music or creating dance, it's also about the whole uh, ecosystem and the whole environment uh, that this is embedded in. It's about teaching and training, uh, making school classes more accessible, making orchestra rooms accessible, uh, make creating awareness about the whole music ecosystem and industry about uh, the needs for being more accessible and, and inclusive. We had one um, AWD a few years ago from Turkey, uh, they simply created music notes that can be read by people who are blind. So this, this uh, thinking of it as much more uh, than uh, literally meets the eye. No? Actually, I'm really excited that you said that because that's a great segue into um, speaking about music and speaking about how we create music uh, these days, music is so intertwined with technology, and when folks with different disabilities uh, want to, to take an instrument, learn an instrument, so that they can be able to grow and create, uh, they do face barriers on just the way instruments are set up. They do face barriers in maybe the ability to access technology. And so I know that there are a lot of innovations happening in trying to make music instrumentation and music creation more accessible. And I wanna take this time now um, to actually showcase this amazing new technology that's been taking by storm called iHarp. And so we're gonna play a video about this, this really cool new instrument. But Michael, you uh, please give us sort of like the rundown of what iHarp is before we play this video. Yes, it was an uh, zero project of, of, of this year. Uh, it's um, um, a person from, I think, originally Greece, but uh, being now at the University of, of Barcelona, and he created um, a music instrument uh, for people uh, with severe disabilities who can only move their head a little or their eyes, and they can um, yeah, s play a music instrument by simply eye-click. Uh, so they, we will see this in the video, they looking at the screen and have learned the technique uh, to play music by simply using your eyeballs on, on, on the screen. and. Uh, this has uh, been a great success, not only for people using it, uh, but also at the Zero Project Conference. So this was definitely a star at the, at the conference. Amazing, thank you Ryan for showing us this video. I hope. iHarp is the first inclusive musical instrument that allows people with disabilities to play music with eye or head movements. Music 
Using an eye tracker, users can play melodies by looking at the notes on the screen. Ten years ago, a friend of mine had an accident with a motorbike. We used to play music together. At the beginning, it was not clear whether he would move his arms or not. I was shocked and I realized that back then there was no musical instrument accessible to quadriplegic people. That's when the idea of the iHeart was born. Joel tiene 12 años de edad. Desde que tenía 9 años está estudiando y aprendiendo a tocar música con el iHeart. La afición le viene, le viene dada por sus hermanos mayores que tocan instrumento en la Escuela de Música de Santa Perpetua. Él tenía esa ilusión de querer hacer como sus hermanos y gracias pues a, a este instrumento maravilloso, pues Joel puede tocar música con, con la mirada. Our main mission is inclusivity, that people with reduced mobility could be part of music bands and orchestras. that classes of iHarp would be offered in music schools. In fact, some iHarp musicians already play at a professional level. That is amazing. I, when I saw that, I was like, yes. <laughs> Can I get one? Can I get one? <laughs> um, so <laughs> All right, that was actually a very, um, you know, it's amazing to see this kind of technology being brought into the world. And I guess the question that I have for the panel after watching that, so one of the things that I've found in my work is that a lot of folks, young folks that want to do music, decide against it because their first question is, well, how would I even be able to do it? Um, but I've also found, when dealing with major br music brands, that making accessible technology is an afterthought for them. So what needs to happen, you know, what can we do to sort of mainstream music technology to make uh, folks want to start creating things like this and to also make these major brands uh, want to pick up on this as well. Anyone? <laughs> I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, as someone who is not from the music industry, I'm, I'm here representing film. Um, I feel like there are a lot of similarities, obviously, in the, in the barriers to actually, for people to be able to create film, watch film, um, and, and a lot of it is similar. And I think 
the one thing that I actually am, am wondering about um, generally is, is beyond uh, people thinking and having it as an afterthought um, is, is, what, is what are the things that we could do um, to get people more informed? Um, and I think a lot of, uh, of the issues we're having and a lot of the challenges in film as well is, uh, is basically education. And a lot of people don't, uh, first of all, don't understand who their audience is. And there's so many audiences for creating musical instruments, for consuming music, for, for being uh, performers um, that are, are disabled and, and uh, are out there and uh, they could make money on by selling them stuff and by, uh, but no, but I mean, uh, but, but really being part of, uh, of the creative community as well. Um, but I think the other aspect that I have encountered a lot in film also is people just don't understand what the steps are to be accessible, um, what that even involves. Um, and with film, there are obviously certain steps, and with music, um, obviously there, there are other ways of being creative and doing this. And I think the, the issue is a lot of times uh, it's not out there, people don't talk about it, or people haven't been talking to their uh, disabled friends enough to ask them what they need. Um, and what kind of, uh, of other areas they can expand into and, uh, and be creative with accessibility, not just with the actual music, but how do we combine those two? This is Connie. Yeah, that was great. There, I really believe in education as well. Um, one of the things that really struck me in that video, um, and that is particularly true in a lot of innovations, is he knew his friend became a quadriplegic, and he wanted to help him make music. In many of the social innovations that uh, are seen in the Zero Project, it's a family member that's inspired because of a family member or a friend who acquires or is born with um, a disability. Um, I can think of like um, s some of the speak boards that have been innovated um, and um, awarded prizes at Zero Project. It, it, it comes from a father who wanted to speak with a child and had no way to communicate with his child. And so he created, he learned how to code and, and how to do all these things to create things. So we need um, more organizations like Zero Project that can uh, propel these social innovators into the arena of, of the public and um, other like people. So that was an unsolicited plug for Zero Project, <laughs> but I, I really believe in that. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you for that. But uh, also to, <laughs> to, to put this again into, into perspective, I think it's a lot on, on awareness raising. And I start by pointing out that this video was not accessible for people who are blind or visually impaired. And so uh, we th this is uh, something that's also important to notice. and. Um, I'm telling this quite deliberately because the next video you're going to watch, uh, you will see this from a perspective of someone who is visually impaired or blind. It would have needed some explanation what's going on. Uh, that's different people were playing instruments, uh, the situation that they were playing with, what you saw on the screen that you saw at the same time, the person playing and, uh, and, uh, and, and the, the, the screen. Uh, so that would, uh, an, an ideal video with all the description would have integrated this. So um, that's... Uh, to put Zero Project into perspective, we are, we are not perfect, it's a journey. Yes, and thank you for that. Um, it, everything is a learning process, and um, I think a couple of things that I would say very quickly uh, about this is that, you know, uh, another solution that folks really need to consider is that, kind of piggybacking off of what Connie is saying, that we need more organizations that want to work to do this, uh, but we need to make sure that folks who identify as disabled are in that leadership. Because it's not just about a family member or a friend um, wanting to help someone in their family. Why is it that that actual person is not on the board or making the decisions? We need more folks with disabilities running these arts organizations because they already have the lived experience and they also have the network of folks that they can pull from that they already know um, can do these things. But this also brought me to another question. Going to what Yara said about, hey, if you market to people with disabilities, you have this whole new market. I mean, at the end of the day, folks with disabilities, including their caregivers and their family and friends, actually, at least in America, have a $1 trillion buying power. And so that's a lot of money we're leaving on the table. So my question is, 
Well, a key driver for uh, inclusion of people with disabilities, whether it be in music or film, any you know innovation, creative innovation, um, will the financial argument be something that helps mainstream the movement, or will actually financing and finances be the detriment? Because a lot of times, let's say for instance, venues, um, they want to complain about the fact that they might have to make their space accessible. So is the financial argument good, or is actually finance the detriment when it comes to arts and innovation for disability? Go ahead, Yara, I know you have something to say. <laughs> That's a tough one, I was, gonna, I was gonna wait for you to actually take that one first. <laughs> Do you wanna start, Connie? Yep. <laughs> if you want, I can start, so. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's somehow both. No? So there are, awareness raising is, is it comes for free. No? Uh, so pointing out this video, this costs nothing to do it in a, in a different way. No? On the other hand, there are things that cost a lot uh, to make it fully accessible and um, uh, sign language is costly. Uh, there's, there are measures that definitely cost a lot. No? Uh, on the other hand, uh, um, yeah, um, talking about audiences, uh, that the percentage of people who are hard of hearing or deaf is increasing uh, every year because fortunately the uh, world population is getting older and it comes with uh, hard of hearingness and of uh, visual problems. So this market is increasingly steadily. So there's a, an argument for, uh, for, the for, uh, for uh, also from the profit uh, side that market size is increasing. And I would argue that um, when you make your venue accessible, you're bringing in more audience members. I can attest to this in Philadelphia. We have an organization called ArtReach, and they create with different uh, venues, the opera, the, the music houses, sensory-friendly um, performances. And those families that come to these performances sometimes only stay 10 minutes or maybe a half hour, and then the next time they come, they stay a little bit longer. So we're building audience participation, revenue, when we do invest in accessibility features. Thank you for going first. That, that actually leads me to what I am thinking about the other side of the financial excuse of this is, this is too much, it costs too much, and I, I actually don't think it makes sense because I feel like so many things cost a lot. There, there, there's so many aspects in the budget line um, that people are just putting there obviously. Um, on, a, on a film set, there's a whole budget for uh, food for the film crew, right? Um, obviously that's something that's important and they will complain if they don't have it. Um, that's something that was put in there because there was a reason for, for that to, to become there. Um, and I think it's just about let's, let's get that in the budget line. Like this can be part of an uh, any venue. Um, this is something that should be in consideration. Um, there are obviously so many levels and some so many things that people can do, and people will always could always use more money, but they can also do things with with less money. And I always um, when I when I whenever I talk about this, and people also ask, uh, you know, filmmakers ask, how can I be accessible? How can I do this? And you give them a whole list of things. They don't need to do every single one of them. That, that will never you know, be possible to achieve all of the accessibility goals. But it doesn't mean you can't do some of them, and you d it doesn't mean you can't be creative in how much money you spend, what solutions you find, at least to begin with. And as you were talking about things being an afterthought, um, the more they are not an afterthought, that they're there as part of the planning, and it is very obvious that this is part of the budget, same as marketing is, same as other different aspects of having and running events and being, you know, creating amazing things, um, that, that shouldn't be an excuse. Um, just to wrap that up, I could not uh, agree more to that. Uh, we are not making music, but we're organizing a large conference and you simply have to do that. You have to be accessible, no matter what the cost, period. Yeah, let's get accessible at the budget time, guys. When we're coming up with the budget, let's consider accessibility. Um, all right, so going back to what Connie said, talking about um, spaces and, and sensory inclusive spaces that in include uh, all different disabilities and, and working together to make sure folks with disabilities and without disabilities can, inc can enjoy music. Um, this brings me to our next video. I don't know if that was a good enough segue, I tried. Um, <laughs> this brings me to our next video um, about Concert House. 
Uh, please tell us more about that. Yeah, this is um, uh, a video about uh, one of the uh, most famous concert venues in Vienna, um, the Wiener Konzerthaus, and uh, they have introduced um, an inclusive format of making music and, and, and arts and dance uh, together, uh, and it has become a, a major feature and success of, um, of the Konzerthaus. And this is what we're going to see now. Thank you. from Vienna and welcome to Wiener Konzerthaus. It's a great honor for us to present our Summer Music Week at the Zero Project side event of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. Thank you very much for having us. Our goal at Wiener Konzerthaus is to make our institution more accessible so that everyone in the city can participate in the cultural life without any barriers. All people should have the opportunity to shape cultural life in a self-determined way. Summer Music Week is a very essential part of our outreach program and it is very important to us that it is free of charge. The event takes place for the fourth time this year in the week from July 2nd to 6th, 2022. It is aimed at all people with and without disabilities and open to everyone who already knows how to play an instrument as well as to those who just love music but do not have any previous musical experience. For five days, participants of the ages from 7 to 99 make music together in every hall of Wiener Konzerthaus, and we have four of them. The workshops include a choir, a chamber music group, a band and two percussion groups, and they take place under the guidance and support of professional musicians. Some of the participants are joining us for the first time, while others have been supporting the house for many years as visitors, subscribers or members. All groups are very diverse, however, the musical program focuses on the individual strengths and talents of the participants. At the end of the week, every group presents what they have been working on on stage in the main concert hall. We believe that the most important aspect of Summer Music Week is that music has the power to connect people regardless of origin, language, religion, gender, age or disability. Our goal is to create a safe space for every single participant to learn from and about each other, to share collective knowledge and of course our musical skills. In order to successfully implement barrier-free access to Wiener Konzerthaus, we are trying to involve people from every department in the house and volunteers who are specially trained in working with people with disabilities. We believe that participating in this project can transform personal lives as well as the accessibility and diversity of our institution. The schönste is immer wenn man beisammen, wenn man was zusammen was neues lernt. Ob, ob es ein Lied ist oder ein Musikstück ist. Es hat eine innerliche Verbindung in mir drinnen. Ich kann das spüren. Ich freue mich wahnsinnig. Thank you so much, that's so sweet. Um, okay, uh, after watching that, uh, it brought a question to my mind. Um, 
what will ultimately encourage more organizations, whether it's, you know, more organizations in leisure, whether it's a cinema, whether it's a music festival, um, to become more inclusive and more accessible? What, what will, I know that's a big question, <laughs> but what will ultimately begin to encourage this? I was gonna say ticket sales. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, I think as um, parents of uh, friends of people with disabilities um, ask for these things um, in, in different venues, um, I think that um, it has to become a priority at the board meeting. You know, I mean, we're, we're talking about what do they value, what's the mission. Uh, are we inviting all of our people to the audience or just a select group of people um, to be participating in, in an audience um, situation? I, I also think that um, one of the things that's underrepresented in our panel is deaf culture, and we should recognize that um, deaf culture also makes music and participates in music um, at a very high level. And so I just wanna plug that in there too, that we, we also, um, have some really incredible people around the world. In Austria, um, there's a wonderful uh, rapper who uh, does not have a hearing loss, but his parents, he's a, he's a CODA, a child of, of deaf uh, parents. And um, all his videos, he signs every one of them. Um, and it's amazing. So a shout out to uh, Brani Zunami. So. I thought of two things right now when you were asking me. Um, first of all, I think um, visibility or trendiness is a big thing. I don't know how exactly to, to word that, but I think if it's something that people can see more when they go places, it will encourage them to ask, why is this not at this other event as well? Um, and it will make them wonder, you know, oh, I saw these things and I saw this listed and I saw this, uh, person maybe use these things and then it will make them feel that way when they go to other events and things like that. Um, and then the other aspect of it is, uh, I think I guess it's connected to that. I think um, having more uh, disabled individuals as part of cultural events and being able to have an, ex an inclusive experience and it not being separate, ha not having a special section, not having a special tool, but things that you can experience together um, that's just something that I've gotten from our Real Abilities Film Festivals, n seeing like that there's an entire room of people that are using all of these accessibility um, um, assets and aids, um, but in a way that is just there. It doesn't need to be asked for. It doesn't need to be a special something. Um, just having that experience makes you understand how much you don't see a lot of uh, individuals uh, who are disabled in other areas. And, and that makes you question, it's like, oh, why am I not seeing uh, a whole bunch of the population? Um, and I think um, afterwards, obviously, I hope, hopefully that will trickle into people who are organizing events or, or inviting people in, into um, creating those spaces. I'd just like to point out two things that have been mentioned already in one way or the other. One is uh, decision, decision makers uh, with disabilities, so inclusion on, 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 on board levels would definitely uh, be a, a change maker to promote that. And the other one is um, the, the inclusion aspect. So uh, I think in the past decades, um, there were a trend of uh, a band of people with disabilities, a music group, only people with disabilities. I think that's a, that's a dead end. No? So making it more inclusive, adding uh, to, to mainstream music, making this more diverse and inclusive, that's, that's the way forward. I'd like to add one thing, and, and that is um, the economic situation of people with disabilities. You know, people with disabilities have a higher cost to go to a performance. They have to really uh, think about their tra transportation. They have to think about the cost. Um, they have to think about if they have to bring an attendant with them. Um, so there's a lot of economic factors that keep disability uh, or disabled people away from artistic venues and cultural venues because of every, uh, every economic cost that it takes for them to get and enjoy that event. 
Yeah, these are really great points. Um, there's just a couple I want to highlight because this is really where I focus a lot of my thoughts every day when I lay my head on the pillow. So, um, you know, at Ramped, Recording Artists and Music Professionals with Disabilities, um, we, it's, it's what we do. Uh, we advocate for accessibility at venues along with inclusion um, in the mainstream music industry. And a couple of things that we had thought would be great solutions for that um, is A, like Yara mentioned, uh, seeing more accessibility at major venues um, so that when the smaller venues see that, uh, they work to do it as well. And one of the things we did at Ramped was we helped get a, um, a ramp um, at the Grammys and ASL on the Grammys red carpet. And a lot of folks see that, right? That's an international event. So that was one of the things that we tried to work to do to make sure we get that trickle down effect. Another thing is artists, especially major artists, have a lot of clout with what they can say they want. And we're noticing uh, a bit more of a trend called an inclusion writer in Hollywood where folks in Hollywood are saying, hey, I wanna make sure that when we do a production, there are more LGBTQ folks and that tra um, staff is trained in sensitivity and things like that. I wanna see more accessibility included in these inclusion writers. So let's be an inclusive inclusion writer for accessibility. And if we start having artists say that they want these things at their shows, um, that will begin to start making change. And then the last thing that was mentioned was that we need to see more creators with disabilities on the main stages. Uh, we need to see them as uh, uh, not only in Hollywood, but as musicians winning these awards and, and being on these music videos so that other folks with disabilities can start to realize that they can also do this as well. And it starts to change the social narrative uh, music is a big driver of culture and allowing other people to understand a culture. And so through music and through visibility, we can start to change the way society sees things. Um, we're gonna do one last thing here. We're gonna watch one last amazing thing. Speaking of seeing yourself um, as a disabled character so that you can pursue disability as well, I want us to watch this last film, Free Bird. And I actually want to give it to Yara to introduce. Thank you so much, Tati. Um, so uh, we're, you're going to watch the trailer of the film Freebird. Um, this film just participated in Real Abilities 2022. Uh, it was created by uh, Michael Joseph McDonald um, with creative director Nicholas Hurd. Um, and uh, you will see in the video, it's really an amazing example uh, of the combination of uh, inclusive filmmaking as well as music and film. Um, and uh, I think every single person who was in the audience uh, watching this film afterwards uh, could not stop humming the song afterwards, but also being fully impacted um, just by the, it sh it the proof that it's, can it's possible. You can be inclusive, creative, uh, uh, disabled creatives can, can create uh, incredible things and uh, you can see the artistic benefit of it um, on screen. Um, I can tell you some more information about it afterwards. Hey bear, come here. Want to meet people? Sit. Paw. Hey, stop getting by nuts. Okay, let's get serious for a moment. I was on Twitter and I saw this message. I wish there were more films for people with Down syndrome more. And actually, we got an animation studio. And it's one of the best animation studios in Canada. There's a lot of artists right now who are working second by second for this four minute story. Kind of truth. I have not seen anyone with Down syndrome in animation until now. This animation, this year. We just love it. It's, it's very rare that we get to work on something that feels so meaningful to us. 
So get ready to watch it, like it, love it, and share with other people around you. When we look at it internally, all together, everybody still gets moved. You don't have to learn to ski. You don't have to have a degree. You don't have to you know, be CGI in the world. <laughs> you can be a non-CGI character and have a right to live in the world of animation. I'm actually feeling some tears right now because I can't even watch them because normally you don't see yourself like that. He got a lot. Awesome. That was really, really beautiful. Um, did you want to talk any uh, a bit more about the creation of that? Um, I uh, this microphone is much louder. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, I actually, um, uh, what you saw here is a, a little glimpse of the creation of it and is, uh, is wonderful. I actually just wanted to share from the experience of having Michael and Nicholas attend the festival and, and be part of the conversation in the films. And, um, and I think what Nicholas says here um, in, in this little clip is he, he was talking about he hasn't been able to see himself on screen. Um, this is not something that he has experienced, and, um, and uh, during the festival, they we invited them to come. They were supposed to be there for three days. They ended up staying for the full week. They extended their flights. They came in from Canada, and they both Michael and Nicholas came to every single one of the screenings. And um, beyond uh, creating and making this amazing film, which I forgot you can't hear the the music of, but you can actually look up this film online, um, Free Bird by Michael Joseph McDonald. You can see the full film there. Um, but, but beyond that, I think the realization that I had seeing um, Nicholas and Michael in the audience and understanding that they're seeing them, themselves represented on screen in so many different ways is, uh, is, was a big uh, understanding that, yes, as, as you were mentioning, Lachi, visibility is so important. And I think that is what drew uh, Nicholas and, and other creatives to, to make it um, and, and express themselves. And, share their work and art, and it's amazing. I love that. Um, you know, how can film, and, and this is for anyone, but how can film and music, um, how can the film and music industry work together, hand in hand, um, to remove barriers? Whether it be film, music, dance, um, other artistic, innovative industries, how can we come together to remove barriers? Madam Connie. <laughs> Since I'm holding the mic. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> well, I think um, it comes first, uh, the first word that comes is collaboration. Is that when you're in the, the phase of thinking about a project, that you think about inclusion of your project, creating um, collaborations of different kinds of musicians working together, dancers working together, film, film work. So, I think collaboration is looking for uh, a partner that you haven't worked with before. You know, find something new, a new lens to view your art from, I think is really important. Awesome. Um, I want to open it up for any last remarks about innovation, inclusion in the arts, how we can break down any more barriers, and, um, or just shout outs <laughs> and self plugs. <laughs> okay, well, I will shout out and self-plug. Um, I'm really excited to have been invited to do this. This was such an amazing uh, discussion um, with such an amazing distinguished panel. I want to thank um, the, uh, what is your name? The Austrian cultural... <laughs> For, for hosting this event, obviously the Zero Project for making these, um, these uh, 
uh, supporting organizations that are breaking down barriers for people with disabilities. Obviously, Connie and Danceability for that amazing, beautiful dance and her dancers who are still here. And also, of course, the amazing Yara and Real Abilities Film Festival for talking about inclusion in film. And I also want to thank myself for being gorgeous and amazing. <laughs> That round of applause is for everyone, but thank you all so much. And I don't know if you want to say one last thing, Michael, but that's my time. Well, the mission of the Zero Project is uh, to also change minds and advocate for uh, inclusiveness and, and, uh, and accessibility. And if everyone in the audience here in the room and, and, and online tomorrow takes something away uh, that changes their ways of thinking and of, 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 of acting the next time that they're confronted with music or performance, uh, then I think uh, mission accomplished, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all, thank you so much. Just a quick word from me. Thank you so much to the panelists and the to, to the performers. I think you've given us a lot of food for thought and for conversation. So I would suggest we indulge in some conversation and you join us for a glass of wine outside. Thank you. And I hear the wine is awesome. <laughs>